I'm current chairman of the board of directors and I'm former editor-in-chief of the Daily Free Press and former city editor. Hi, I'm Sarah. I am the former features editor and current managing editor. Hi, and I'm the current photo editor. Hi, I'm Diana. I'm the secretary and legal chair on the board of directors and a former managing editor and features editor. Hi, I'm Vivian. I'm the alumni chair on the board of directors and I'm the former photo editor. Okay. Is that Oh, there's still me. Hey everyone, I'm Hillary. I am the current treasurer on the board of directors and I was the opinion editor last spring. And I'm Max. I'm the uh, current sports editor for this upcoming fall. And I'm Cameron. I am the features editor. I'm Colby. I'm the opinion editor. And I'm Melissa. I'm the current campus editor. Okay, so today we're pretty much gonna start with um, more of like the structure of how to write journalistically. So we're gonna screen share another slideshow. Do you guys all see my screen? Okay. Yeah, so this is pretty much the schedule for our session today. So we're gonna start with basic hard news, features, opinions, sports, photo, and video. Okay, so we're gonna go into news writing. All right, so the most basic, um, kind of guideline for writing hard news um, is you follow the inverted pyramid style. Of course, there are a lot of articles where this style is outdated, but this is just kind of the foundational style that you would follow. So you would start with the lead, which is the opening sentence. Um, so the lead is basically, it contains the most important out of the, like the who, when, when where, why, um, how something happened. You don't want to. You don't want to have all of the important information in the first sentence because there could be too much. So you kind of pick what is the main, biggest point, and then that is what you use to form your lead. Um, and then always go for kind of the point of what happened rather than just what happened. So for example, if you say. Um, Boston University announced a new rule Friday or like is hosting an event Friday. That doesn't tell anyone anything because like it's like what is the rule or what is the event. So always make sure that you convey the point of what you're saying. So hard news leads are basically typically for breaking news. Um, otherwise it could be good to use anecdotal leads at your discussion. Um, it's especially fitting for feature stories. So when a story is not super time sensitive and a hard news lead might come off as just too boring, then you can totally go for a more feature style lead by kind of um, placing them into the shoes of someone else and kind of describing their experience and leading that into what the story actually is. So a lead is usually one or two sentences at most. You don't want it to be too long. And then right after the opening paragraph, you would go into what's called the nut graph, which is the second paragraph. So that usually con contains like the, the remaining five W's. Um, it's basically relevant facts that aren't quite crucial enough to go into the lead, but still essential to the story. So it kind of provides context without diving into super extraneous detail. And then as for the general paragraph style of your story, you want it to basically structure it so that the content flows from most to least important. So think of it like if you're writing a story for print and 
we need to shorten your story to fit into the paper, then we could just cut from the bottom and then you won't really lose as much essence. Um, so as for the graphs themselves, each paragraph should be no more than a few sentences. I would say one or two is pretty standard and three maximum. So now we're gonna go into like the style of news writing. So journalistic writing is a lot different from academic writing. They're kind of opposites in a way. Um, so the first component of that is journalistic writing is super concise. Like that is what you're going for. It's, you're not trying to write in a really complex way. You're trying to do, um, you're trying to word your words as succinctly as possible because it's just clearer and easier to read. And it's also more enjoyable for readers. So avoid superfluous, superfluous phrases such as in order to, like just do two or in efforts to, like it's not really necessary. So just kind of cut wherever you can. As for simplicity, don't ever use field specific jargon or words that are too formal or academic in your writing because readers probably don't always know what they mean. And your job is to explain it in an easy to understand way. So if you don't know what something means, then your reader probably doesn't either. So you can Google it or ask an expert that you're talking to, whatever it takes, just explain it in a way so that a sixth grader could understand it. Because the job of journalism is to inform the public. And so your writing must be accessible to those of all English language comprehension levels. Um, and then for objectivity, basically don't use adjectives in your writing. Um, don't use connotative words like even or unfortunately or already. And when you're quoting someone, only ever use the word said, like uh, the, the spokesperson said. You don't want to write anything like exclaimed or maintained or asserted, anything like that, because those words, even if they seem harmless, they still connote some sort of emotion. And you don't want to like, you don't want to tell someone what a certain person was thinking or feeling. You want to just have the word said be invisible. And it's just, mm -hmm. it, it could, you could, if you're into like super creative academic writing, you might not want to do that because it just sounds repetitive. But that's the point is you want it to be invisible. So, okay. So, as for quotes, the way that that works is that each quote each full quote at least is usually its own paragraph and it's no more than the length of two sentences. So you can also use partial quotes um, in your writing but use them sparingly, uh, mainly for strong adjectives that someone said or something that connotes or something that tells you something important. So don't quote like boring factual statements that you can just paraphrase in your own words. So things like stats or complicated phrasing or just academic jargon, um, do quote sentences that show emotion or personal experience or their opinion or things like that. Um, and when you're wording them, these are just kind of little more complex uh, rules, but just when you're referring to people, you use said, um, if it's spoken, you use wrote, if it's written, if, if they send you an email, you can't say that they said this, you can say that they wrote it. Um, so yeah, just there's, there are a bunch of little tiny style rules that dictate um, how you can phrase things. And that goes into AP style. So basically AP style is associated press style. It's used in the field of journalism and public relations. Um, and the AP style book is constantly updated all the time. So even if you buy an edition of it this year, you'll probably have to buy one half a year later. So um, just, Try to keep up with it. Um, follow AP Style on Twitter. It's a set of, it's kind of like MLA or the Chicago or any other style out there. Um, it seems hard to learn at first, but if you just keep practicing, it'll pretty much become second nature. It's just the way that journalists write. It's kind of standardized. Um, so there are a lot of rules. If you're ever in doubt of something, simply Google topic and then AP style, and then it'll tell you how to do it. So 
yeah, most newsrooms use not just AP style and they don't always follow all the rules of AP style. They usually use like a mixture of AP style and their own style. So yeah, that's something to keep in mind. Okay. I can't really see the rest of the room. Are there any questions in the Q&A box? Not yet. So we're going to go on to feature rating. Okay. Um, so as Angela mentioned, um, typically with features, you have more of an anecdotal lead. Um, a feature story is anywhere from like 700 to 800 words. It could be a lot longer. Uh, it could be like over a thousand. So that's like the the most superficial uh, difference between the two. Um, and I like to think of features as more uh, commenting on larger themes or contextualizing the story. Uh, so that could be relating the story to uh, a larger cultural event, political event, um, and also having multiple perspectives. Um, so typically with like a hard news story, you would hear from say like a university spokesperson or one authority figure, whereas with features, you could hear from attendees at an event, uh, as well as experts. Um, so I like to really have like a range of different sources um, when you're writing features. So when you're going about structuring a feature, unlike news stories, how Angela went over the inverted pyramid style, you have a little bit more freedom with how you want to structure everything. So you can choose either to make your feature story linear or it can be non-linear where you can play with the chronology a little bit there. Um, so that's really just a case by case basis to see what works best. But since features are primarily narrative, you oftentimes um, might switch up that order. And um, your lead is always with a feature going to be anecdotal or it's it won't be a hard news lead since the main emphasis of a feature isn't that an event just happened like cami said it um goes into a more in-depth look so really it's important to start out features with a very eye-grabbing entry point um so as a lot of journalism professors always say the best way to start an article like this is often thinking about the first thing you would tell a friend or someone if you were to be talking about the article you're covering and the interviews you conducted. Um, and because it is very narrative and it can take on a longer form, it's very important for the conclusion to round out the story. So oftentimes the best approach to this is using a really strong quote. But in this instance, you'd also want to make sure that the quote kind of ties into the broader topic of the whole article. Um, so oftentimes when I'm interviewing someone, when I'm writing a feature, a certain quote will grab my attention and I'll kind of set that aside as what I know I want to end on. Yeah, I, I think like just a really good point with features is to write or start an article with something that you think is really interesting. Because if you think it's interesting, your reader is probably going to think it's interesting too. Um, so that's kind of like the great thing with features is that you have that creative liberty. Um, I guess specifically for profiles, that's just a specific um, article about one particular person or organization. So um, you're not just talking to that one person or that one group. You still want to get multiple perspectives. Um, but when you want to write about that one person, it needs to uh, be some kind of newsworthy uh, article. So um, did they just complete like a project uh, that was really notable? Um, or do they do it? Does a club, uh, did a club just like host an event that was uh, pretty popular? Or did they have some new initiative? Uh, things like that. Um, so reaching out to like not only the profiles like colleagues or professors, but also their team members or supervisors, collaborators, um, things like that. Um, 
I guess I guess we'll move on to events. Um, the main difference between a features event and a hard news event is not only hearing from multiple perspectives, but also, like I mentioned, contextualizing the event. So you always kind of mention the why in the who, what, where, where, who, what, where, when, why, how uh, sort of scheme for both hard news and features. However, you want to delve into the broader context of that and maybe how uh, a particular event could impact the community or the uh, university in which it's held. Um, so, yeah, um, I'm just thinking of an example. We um, did a, a round table interview with uh, Judd Apatow, who directed King of Staten Island a couple months ago. Uh, so that was a features event. Um, there was a really creative lead about uh, the symbolism of firefighters and heroes. Um, so that was one features event that we covered. So it's kind of thinking about um, the most interesting takeaway of an event, starting out your event, your features event that way um, and launching into, into your angle, excuse me. Um, yeah. And, and if you're thinking about some sort of annual event, which you know we don't typically cover, it's always really important to start out with a really interesting perspective or angle that will make that coverage different from maybe previous coverage, not only in your publication, but maybe uh, elsewhere. Um, so if you want to cover an annual event, you have to find something that's particularly different about it that is worth writing about. And, you know, couldn't just be like a social media post. Um, so just as a quick example, um, we covered the Transgender Day of Remembrance uh, a few months ago, and that is the 30 something annual event. So we had to find a way to engage our readers um, and find kind of a new perspective to cover that. Um, so yeah. And then we'll move on to review writing, which is unique in comparison to the other features that we just mentioned and news articles, because in this instance, the writer has room to be subjective. Um, and also this can take on a bit more conversational and informal of a tone. Uh, and really the goal here is to develop rapport with the audience. It's kind of like a conversation, but obviously it is ultimately one-sided. Um, but the overarching goal of reviews is really to inform, analyze, and advise readers. So first and foremost, the writer should go over what it is that they're covering. So the type of work, is it a movie, album, what's the format, um, who contributed to it? So if it's a movie, the actors, the director, if it's an album, obviously the artist who contributed and if there were any features as well. And then describing and summarizing the work in general but it's important to not go too far in depth with this because never reviews are never about adding spoilers in. Really, this should be a bit of a sneak peek that can let readers know whether or not they're interested in consuming this work, whatever form it's in. So they shouldn't walk away knowing everything. They should really just have an idea of whether or not they think this sounds like something that would interest them. So as I said before, this is some, this is a format of article where you would be adding in some opinion. So it's really important that anytime you have a, uh, anything that's commentary that you want to add, you back that up with evidence. And wherever it's possible to include a short excerpt from the work, it's great to do so. Whether that's lyrics from songs or um, quotes or whatever from movies. Um, and when you're writing the review, be sure to be firm with your take so that the reader knows where you stand with everything. But of course, there's also always room for a little bit of nuance. So you can say, I really enjoyed X movie, go into the different factors that contributed to it. But it's also very fair. It could be good writing as well to go into the different things that you weren't such a big fan of. And on that topic, it's important to also just be fair in general. So if you're going to be going over a film or a music and you're gonna say it's not worth watching or listening to, there should be a long list of reasons beyond just one minor thing you didn't like. Um, so ultimately, when you're making your opinion very clear in the end, it can be helpful to do something like rate it out of five stars or have a clear point that readers can point to to understand exactly how you would 
give your opinion on this piece of work. And then as um, Angela said before with news writing, it's best to just use the simplest terms so that everyone can follow along. I know when talking about films and with music that people have different levels of knowledge and expertise in those subjects. So there's a lot of jargon that you can use, but really that would limit the pool of readers that could really fully appreciate what you wrote. So it's best to just keep the simplest term and the most direct language. So then just a few general takeaways about what Kimmy and I have gone over with features. Um, so when you're wanting to go write a feature and you don't have, you're trying to figure out what would possibly be of interest to you and your readers, the best thing you can utilize is just your own curiosity. Anything that you think is interesting enough to merit an entire article, I'm sure many people would as well. Um, so just keeping your eyes open, your ears, listening to everything, observing things as simple as like new posters on a wall and a student union, or just hearing something that a bunch of your peers are talking about either in person or on social media. Those can all be great ways to point you to a feature idea. Um, but also just be wary that when you're exploring a potential idea, it's it merits a full story. I know personally when I've tried to pitch some features and think of ideas myself. Um, a lot of times what seems like it can be a great article, it's really just like a Twitter thread or something. It doesn't really need a full fleshed out story. So just be keeping that in mind. Um, and yeah, just be thinking about all the different perspectives to include. And ultimately features are an opportunity to explore any topic, like I said, that you've been curious about. So whether it's a deeper look into a story in the news at the moment, or it's a person that intrigues you, you can introduce readers to topics you're passionate about. So there's a lot of freedom and creativity within features, even if you're still following the structure of journalistic writing. Yeah, and I'd like to just quickly add to the point of, you know, keeping your eyes open. Um, if you're in a university or are still in high school, there are going to be uh, Facebook groups or Instagram accounts that are directly affiliated with your school, even if they're meme accounts. It's so good to follow those and keep tabs on what's going on on your campus, uh, because you never know, like, when you'll stumble on something and be like, oh, that's actually a really interesting features article that I could write about. Um, so being very active online is important too. Yeah, and also when you're interviewing your sources on different articles, it's also great just to keep the conversation open-ended at the end to see if there's anything that they wanna let you know of that you might not otherwise be aware of. So even if you're talking about a very specific topic, even if it's just for a news article, they might tell you something at the end that helps point you to another features idea in the future. Um, alrighty, I guess I can kick us off. Um, so I'd say opinion is kind of its own uh, unique beast within journalism. It, it definitely mirrors um, the way you would approach academic writing a lot more than you would say like a hard news article. So we can start with um, like choosing editorial topics. So first of all, I just want to outline case like not everyone's familiar with it. Like editorial is just um, an opinion piece by the all of that, that basically coalesces all of the editor's opinions into a written argument. Um, in terms of what makes a good topic, well, naturally, you want to be choosing something that isn't like where the, the argument isn't going to be obvious, right? For instance, if I were to talk about, um, I don't know, someone, perhaps there was some like racist incident, and I, I don't want to choose that one and just make the claim like, oh, racism's bad, and this shouldn't have happened. Um, you want to try and pick something where there's going, there's, can be two strong arguments or or two two sides i guess and then you you just don't want to be choosing something that's very black and white um and in terms of managing an editorial board meeting 
going into it, you want to have um, a decent understanding of the article that you're presenting to everyone. And you want to be the, I guess, the go-to expert. You want to be the, the person who can facilitate the conversation and answer everyone's questions to clarify what the topic is about, the little details of the article, um, and such and such. Um, but you also want to be able to, you know, play devil's advocate, ask people to elaborate on their opinions, prepare questions. And all of this is for the purpose of you being able to write something that is thoughtful and nuanced and so that, you know, you don't cut off the meeting at 10 minutes and have to like pull together something that ultimately ends up being obvious. You want to keep detailed notes of the conversation. Um, you want to make sure you don't just read the, the article that you send to all the other editors and yeah, just make sure you come into it with thoughtful questions. You can ask everyone. Um, don't be afraid to ask other people to elaborate on their opinions. And I'd say that's pretty much it for me. Opinion writing is, I'd say it, it doesn't stick to the confines of like other, like other journalism um, categories. Yeah, and so just like going back off of the editorial and writing it, it's really important to make sure that you encompass everyone's ideas and make sure that like you're not just putting your own specific biases or opinions in it. So that's why it's really important to make sure that when the meeting is going on that you're taking really detailed notes. That way when you are writing it, you can use your notes and go back in and make sure that you're hitting all the points that you want to make in your argument. And then the other side of opinion writing is just columns which is what you'll start off with when you join. And Angela, do you mind switching the slide? So when you first start writing, you're gonna kind of come up with your overall theme of what you want your columns to look like every week. And so it can be about anything, but you should really try and make sure that it's something that you're really passionate about because that's going to make it easier to write them. But at the same time, you have to make sure that there's factual information that can back up your argument because otherwise it kind of turns into a blog instead of an opinion piece. Um, so yeah, a lot of, I kind of wrote mine on like kind of politics. Politics is a common one to write about, science things. It could be about anything, but you just have to be able to prove it. And so whenever you are writing, it's important to research what you're talking about and make sure that you have all the proper fact checks and have reliable sources. And the more research that you do on it, the more that you yourself will understand the topic. And so it just makes it a stronger piece. And you have to make sure whenever you're writing it that you have a cohesive argument that's still engaging for the reader and it's not repetitive. Um, so you have to have something that's broad enough for you to have multiple points, but not too broad or not too niche where you can't elaborate on things. And it's kind of like, Hillary mentioned how it's kind of not the typical like journalistic writing. It's kind of more of something that you would write in the classroom. And you have to build off of your points that you're making and transition into like, deeper parts of your argument and make sure that it flows logically. And then in most cases, you're not gonna use quotes. Um, you, you'll use them to credit ideas, obviously, if you can't paraphrase them yourself, um, or if it's an extremely unique idea that you want to add to your column. But most of the time, you're not really gonna use quotes. Yeah, so we had a question in the chat um, asking for the difference between features and opinion. And I'll just broaden that to um, all of news and features versus opinion, where um, any other kind of journalism, you want to not portray your own beliefs or um, opinions on the topic. It's totally, um, you know, non-biased and fair representation of both sides of the issue. And it's all based on having spoken and written sources. Um, whereas opinion is totally your own um, thoughts and you, you will back it up with reasonings, but the reader will clearly know what you believe as a writer. Um, 
what you think about the topic, whereas in news or features, it's totally um, what do other people have to say, and I'm just the one presenting other people's opinions to the reader. Please feel free to ask questions. <laughs> Okay, I'm just gonna start off with sports writing. So um, can you click the next thing, Angela, just so I can go into game coverage? Yeah, thank you. So I'm just gonna start out with uh, some game coverage for y'all here. Um, so I just wanna kind of split it up into first of kind of um, game coverage, a lot of involves having to get quotes from coaches and players. It's kind of wanna have, to, I just wanna split up like how you were to talk to a coach and how you're to talk to a player because both are like very different animals. So usually if you come into a college setting, kind of like BU or ours, where we're not like a huge athletic program, you can, you generally get direct access to the coaches. So it's rather simple of just, you give them a call, you shoot them a text asking, you know, can we talk at such and such a time? I want to preview this, you know, can we talk at such and such a time in the game after the game? Um, away games, you kind of have to talk to them and just a warning it's very annoying and it usually takes a long time to get a coach to call you just because they've got so much on their mind and po like post game and then home games usually make it very easier because then you're just invited to the press conference and then you can ask them you know whatever you feel like and you're just there person to person but with COVID now I probably expect that to change so I think for the foreseeable future sports writing is going to have to deal with um, just talking to coaches you know, via the tele, via your phone, the internet, et cetera. Um, when you talk to them and address them, I need to just don't call them something informal. Usually don't refer to them by their first name unless you're like with an NFL coach and you're a seasoned journalist. So for all of us right now, like do not refer to a coach by their first name, just call them coach by their last name. Or if their last name is really hard to pronounce, just you can just call them coach. Um, some coaches will be very offended if you mispronounce your last name. Um, for example, BU's lacrosse coach, his last name is Poli, but I think some people pronounced it Polly. And he gets really mad. He gets very upset with you if you screw that up. So I can't stress that you, if you, for whatever reason, think the coach's name is too hard to pronounce, just refer to them as coach. And like I said, just don't refer to them by their first name. Um, you know, always when you have questions for them, always think about questions you want to ask. And a good rule of thumb for when you interview the coach is to just ask them, you know, as a first question, what are your thoughts on the game? You know, because then they can just go on lawn spouts. They can go on a rant for all they want to about, you know, the team performance or something that stuck out from the game. You know, if there was a big moment, you should always ask them about a big moment of the game. And then, yeah, in general, just try not to say anything like, to upset them like you can point out a team's flaws but don't try to embellish a team's flaws don't I don't know don't like try to attack the team for the way they played because I mean you know the the writers and newspapers and different news organizations work very hard to get a good relationship with the coach and like us at the free better sports we have very, a very good relationship with the coaches which is why we can just you know contact them directly on their cell phone and to their personal emails etc but you know if we screw that up, that's going to make our lives a lot harder and it's not going to be fun. Um, so then just to transition, talking about players a, players a little bit, which also kind of goes into game coverage. Um, when you're at a university or a college, you're not going to get direct contact to the players. I cannot stress that you should never contact a player directly. It doesn't matter if like your roommate with them, if they're your best friends, like do not contact them directly in a newspaper setting. So that's like a massive violation of athletic department rules. And then again, we could very, very much screw up our relationship with them if we do something like that. So as a result, you usually you want to go through to a player through the media contact, meaning that every single sport has a person in the athletic department who handles all the requests from the media. And if you give them a request and they deem it good enough, they'll then pass you along to that player. Um, when you're talking to the player, you can refer to them by their first name. You can be more informal with them especially with college players, just because we're on more like quote unquote equal basis with them. But at the same time, do not say anything stupid. You know, don't like take a personal shot at them. Don't try to like really attack their team. You can tell the truth about things, but don't try to like make it like overly personal. Of well, the example of um, 
if any of you are from Boston, you probably know back a couple of years ago, Tom Brady did a documentary and someone on the Boston radio like insulted his daughter and that person was then suspended from the radio and Brady, as Brady stopped appearing on that radio station because he used to do a weekly interview with them. As a result, their listenership tanked because everyone tuned in to hear what Tom Brady was thinking about that week. So as with coaches and players, just do not, I think, just use good common sense. You know, I think everyone can kind of use common sense to tell what is smart to say and what is not smart to say. Um, okay, I think that's all I want to cover with that one. Oh, no, I'm sorry. So, and then just the last point of game coverage is kind of how you want to write during a game. So usually if you're covering it on at home, they're going to give you a spot to watch the game from. Um, you don't necessarily have to start writing your article while you're sitting there, but you should at least take notes of, um, you know, like this person had a good game. They, you know, scored 50 points or whatever. This person scored 10 goals, et cetera. So at the very at least, you should at least try to, it's just good practice to take some notes because then that can easily translate into your article when you feel like it's a good time to start writing it. And then it, even if you can, I think it'd even be a better practice to actually just like write headlines and write graphs as you can while the game is going on. So it just kind of gives you like the work of your article. And it means that, you know, you don't have to wait, you know, for two hours, watch the game and then wait like an hour to get your interview or your press conference and then spend like, another set of time writing your article when it could all be condensed in a lot more of a like efficient fashion. So I think it's just, you know, at the very least, I think when you're covering a game, you should be able to just to take some notes. And then if you're covering an away game, that gets a little more tricky because you we don't travel for away games. Um, most students usually don't from what I can tell. Um, but then that gets a little more complicated, but you know, with technology now that your best practice is to kind of just stream a game. Um, you know, you can have a live stream where you're watching it live. You can get to, uh, can get to, um, oh, like the live stat boxes, they all help you there. So it's just kind of good practice to be able to stream a game or to, you know, at least keep up to date on it if it's an away game and just kind of take note of who's doing what and who's performing well and who's not. So that's all I've kind of really got for game coverage there. And with columns get a little, that's kind of a whole nother animal too. With columns, um, in sports columns, you really don't need to use quotes all that much because your problem columns in sports usually like reflect a lot, you know, talking about professional sports and, you know, we're probably not going to get an interview with someone from professional sports. So a game column just kind of necessarily entails that you like should be able to state your opinion on something. And then the most important thing in a column is being able to use stats to back that up. So you know, if I'm like writing a column about the Tigers and I'm just PO'd at them for playing bad that day, I'm not gonna write like, oh, they're just an awful team, they can't hit when like stats can show you different. Um, you know, it's always a good use to, whenever you like state your opinion, especially on a player not performing well, on a team not performing well, um, you always should at least have some sort of um, statistical backup. And then you can really use quotes if you feel like it. If it's a famous quote, you know, some there's just some famous sports quotes, I'm sure, like we all know some, you can always just use that and insert it. Um, but at the, And sometimes if you think like a team has been described a certain way by a famous person in sports media, you can use that. But in general, like quotes aren't the be all end all with the sports column, especially um, when writing about pro sports. And then, okay, I'm just gonna wrap with the athlete features here. So we usually haven't done a lot of athlete features, but um, they are kind of an important thing to do. And you know, now with COVID, if any of you are interested in sports media, we're gonna be increasingly going to athlete features because, you know, games being played are up in the air for, you know, especially fall sports with um, regards to colleges and universities. So. An athlete feature, like I've said before with game coverage, do not contact an athlete directly. That's the cardinal number one rule. Like never ever do that. I cannot stress that enough. Um, always go through, there's a media contact department. You know, there's a media department contact there for you. Just go through them to get to your player. You know, be clear with what you want. Don't try to say like, oh, can I just talk to this player about such and such, you know, state very clearly what you want. Like I want to talk to this guy who, you know, for a feature I want to write or I'm going to directly quote him 
and then I want to write it about this. Don't try to like be misleading. Um, just state very clearly what you want and then they can, that athletic department will then make a decision based on what you've told them. And then just if you then do get approved, the questions you want to ask, you generally want to get them to ask, you want to ask very broad and open-ended questions because the specific thing about an athlete feature or if you're featuring a coach of some sort is that they can provide like firsthand scenes and firsthand accounts of stuff behind the scenes that we don't see, like team meetings, you know, the team bus rides, you know, the their practices, their weightlifting sessions, et cetera, because they all get a view into that. They're all experiencing it. And they're kind of the ones who are on the team, see the bonding, like see the growth, et cetera. So you want to ask them like kind of like very open questions that can get them to describe a scene. So like, for example, I did a athlete feature on one of them, BU's basketball players who graduated last year. He was one of their best players and then led them to the tournament and then the tournament then got canceled way back in March. So I just asked him, you know, like, you know, like what was this, you know, what was like the scene like when you won the Patriot League tournament, but then, you know, about 24 hours later, they pull the plug on you and the rest of the NCAA tournament gets canceled. So it's just, it's good practice to just insinuate in your question that like you kind of want them to describe a scene of something to describe their experience because when you get an athlete feature the whole point of features in general is to sort of kind of get like a more like personal and in-depth perspective that isn't just necessarily reporting that you know this guy scored 20 points this day this guy scored 10 goals whatever so you just kind of want to be able to use your question to get them to describe a scene to kind of create like some interest All right, so before we move on to the more multimedia aspect of this, um, we're going to answer all the questions in the Q&A box. Sorry, we haven't been stopping because I wasn't able to see the, the questions, but we're going to answer a bunch of your questions now. So the first one um, is asking, is grammar important for news writing? Grammar is definitely important and it falls um, along with AP style and whatever style that you're um, news organization um, follows because um, just to keep consistent um, consistency among like every article um, but then it, it comes down to you know we at least at the free our articles go through um, at least three layers of different um, editors and so it the best shape that the story comes in it makes it easier on everyone um, if your story is more close, as close to a publishable as possible when it goes through your editors, it's definitely a great help. Yeah, um, grammar, I think, is, it's complicated. Like, there are different types of grammar, but for uh, news writing, it's kind of the same grammar as any standard English sort of grammar that you would use in professional writing. It's, um, I would say in your articles, yes, grammar matters, um, but not so much necessarily in quotes. Um, I kind of mentioned this in the last workshop, but um, for quotes, it's totally okay if someone doesn't speak in perfect grammar, as long as they're understandable. That's just the way that people speak. So for that, I would say you don't have to try to take out a quote or dramatically change it just because the grammar isn't necessarily up to par with what you would expect good grammar to be. Um, the next question is, the, what's the difference between features and opinion? Um, so Colby, do you want to answer that one? Sure. So opinion, sorry. Um, <clears throat> opinion pieces are, it's your own opinion based. I mean, it's like kind of self-explanatory, but you're arguing your own opinion based on whatever you want to talk about. And you use facts to back up your opinion. Whereas a feature story, you're kind of like covering an event or something that's happening and there's not as much bias. Like opinion pieces are the only pieces that have the open bias where you're, it's like the whole point of it is to show your own opinion. So, and again, you have to use facts to back it up. Yeah, there can be opinion in feature, but that would be the, like your opinion just like same with news like the, all the opinion that's not in an opinion piece is not your own opinion you're sharing someone else's perspective so that's a big difference okay the next question is um, do science and tech 
fall under hard news or features. Um, that's actually my section. I was the science associate. Um, I'm really passionate about science communication. Um, but yeah, so there's cases where it can fall under both, and Melissa's going to talk about hard news. But um, for for features, um, that might be where you want to, you know, profile a researcher. So right now we're trying, we're hoping to be able to profile um, someone working um, on a coronavirus vaccine at BU. Um, and also you might want to just kind of delve deeper into the process of either what the research or the new technology and the specifics of um, not only what it is and like how it works, but um, what impact it will have. So, you know, not every reader is going to understand the specifics of some kind of, you know, robotic machine, but they are, they're reading your article to understand the impact it's going to have on either them or their um, field or society in general. So, um, yeah, you would want to, to go into, you know, that impact that new technologies might have. Melissa, did you want to talk about um, science and hard news? Sorry, can you repeat that? I didn't hear the last yeah. part. Did you want to talk about um, science and hard news? Oh, sure. So, um, like Sarah said, like we have a science department in the feature section, but there are certain cases where a science article may fall under hard news. Usually that would be something where like it just genuinely doesn't merit like a lengthy piece. There isn't necessarily much to be that much to be said about it. Um, examples that I can think of where we've done uh, sciencey type articles would be when a BU PhD student got to present her um, like research at a national um, not fundraiser, that is not the right word, but it was like a national science event. Uh, another example I can think of is I collaborated with another writer on an article where we spoke to a professor and I believe it was a PhD student who were, they were the two of them were working on a um, research that the university was just kickstarting. So it wasn't, there wasn't necessarily that much to be said about it at that point. The research hadn't concluded. There weren't really any big draws from it. It was just that they were getting to do this cool thing. So if it's something like that, where it's something that's just quick, casual happening, uh, it can fall under hard news. Uh, it's more of a judgment call that you have to make. And you can obviously like ask your features editor or ask your um, campus editor or city editor if it's a outside of the BU circle. Um, but those are specific examples that can help you kind of learn hard news versus features for at least science and technology. So we have another question, um, just clarifying again, the difference between features and news. Um, does anyone have anything else that you want to add that we haven't already touched on for, you know, keeping it unbiased and things like that? I can just um, clarify. I think maybe a little bit of the confusion came from talking about reviews because that's like a very specific subsection of feature where you actually would incorporate some commentary. So probably the easiest way to think about it is that reviews are basically something in and of themselves that are completely separate from features. Um, as I said, in a response when you're talking about a movie you can like write an unbiased feature article about the movie where you would talk to the people involved you would include the facts and it would just be incorporating what the interview interviewees said and then what you learned straight out of fact and then you can also write a review on a, a movie as well but in this instance it would just be your commentary and analysis on the quality of the piece of work. So it's like kind of this weird mesh in between features and opinion. So when thinking about the objectivity of feature writing, you can probably just remove reviews from that completely in your mind. It's re it really is its own very specific category that happens to be published under the feature section. And when you're encountering a review, it's usually pretty obvious that it's going to have some subjectivity in it because it might have in the headline review or something that clearly distinguishes that this is not going to be your normal article. I would also say that when we're thinking about the difference between news and feature, I think um, 
opinion is probably not the right thing to focus on because um, so news and features, hard news and features are really similar in a lot of ways and it mostly has to do with style. Like a lot of news stories can be written in a feature style and a lot of feature stories are also news stories. So it's not that one has more opinion than the other. Um, like, like Diana said, it's that might have come from reviews, but in features still, for the most part, you're not expressing your own opinion in any way. If there's any opinion, you can have more creativity in writing, but if there's any opinion, it should not be coming from you, it should be coming from the sources. So then we have the question, um, why wouldn't you use quotes in opinion writing um, when backing up your point? So Hillary, do you want to answer? Um, sure thing. So I'd say it's not uh, like always a hard no, but the thing about opinion writing is that you want to stick to your argument. You you want to make be you want to be very clear about what you're trying to say about X Y Z topic. So the reason that you wouldn't introduce someone else's quote uh, a quote from someone else on that topic is that you don't want to essentially dilute your argument or possibly. Or, or the another case would be you're you're adding another layer to your argument that isn't yours. So there's like um the word I'm looking for. There's like fears of plagiarizing there, but that's obviously on a very uh, far extreme. But that's basically the idea in terms of like absolute terms. Like for instance, you're quoting a statistic. Obviously, that's doable, but it's it's also much easier to just um, incorporate like. If we're talking about percentages, like, oh, like X percent of blah said this or X percent of blah surveyed said this. It's it's not really something that's, um, it's more of something that you're supporting your opinion with, not like something that could change the perception of your argument. I don't know. Colby, do you think that's like a good description? Yeah, I think, yeah, I think you covered it pretty well. Um I guess like the whole point of opinion pieces is that you're showing your own argument and I feel like it comes across stronger if you are able to articulate it yourself rather than using too many quotes because then it's not necessarily your idea anymore. But quotes do come in handy. Like if it, if you can't paraphrase it better than the way that the original writer said it. So it kind of is, it's definitely like a case to case basis and you kind of just have to feel it out as you're writing. But for the most part, you won't be using quotes just because you're relying on your own argument for most of it. Okay, and then we have, for something like environmental issues, how do you cover both sides of a policy update or event? Um, so yeah, you're definitely gonna you know, have to cover um, some kind of topic where you, know, you would think that there's only one side and, or it might be hard to find the other side. Um, so that's, first of all, I would say that's definitely something to, um, you know, talk to your editors and even just other people around you of who like just asking, do you know anyone who has the opposing opinion um, as what all my other sources have said? Um, talk to your editors about who else, where else you they think you should look. Um, so one example I can think of is, um, I did like a person on the street story um, just about um, Trump and the election and every single person I approached was anti-Trump and you know that you have to take into account like we're in Boston um, and so that's not representative of the entire population of Boston but um, you know it's representative of the people who were in the place that I was at that point in time who everyone who I approached um, just happened to have that opinion. And that's something, you know, you have to acknowledge and, but it's, it's not representative of the whole. Um, so then we have another question. How much context do you need to include in an opinion piece? Um, I can go or, uh, Essentially, how I always approached it was I'd incorporate like a lead of like major details. Um, so for instance, there was a major highway project happening in Alston. So I'd say like, uh, you know, when it's starting, like when the project is starting to happen, what, what are the motivations, basically who, what, when, where, why, but it's, but 
it's not as important as I say as the like as you developing your argument about whatever the topic may be. Yeah, I agree. I think the first paragraph's really important to like basically set the scene for what you're arguing and give some perspective and background to people who are reading your piece because some people might not even know what you're talking about or like not may not be familiar with the things you'll be just arguing so I find that in my first paragraph I kind of just like to give more background and even try and make it more personal to me and like see how I can draw in my personal experiences into it which also just helps make your argument stronger. There's one question that says, so if I'm writing for an organization that's trying to spread environmental awareness, would I still have to find someone who is against their mission? I would say, um, yeah, you would want that, but that doesn't mean that that including them means that you're necessarily like, your article is supporting their stance because you have to figure out, like, it's always good to figure out why exactly they're against their mission. Are their facts valid or are they not using facts? So it's like, you wanna give their perspective that platform, but you also wanna contextualize what their perspective means and how they came about that. And so if it's not a platform where it's necessary, like, you, you just be careful about spreading misinformation. Obviously, whoever the source is, for any side of any issue, you're not going to take just their word for face value. Like, um, you want to give them that coverage, but you don't want to cover something as true when it might not be. And I would also say when it comes to like, if you're saying for this environmental organization or publication, you should have an opposing side if there is a clear opposing side there that the story would feel like it's lacking without it. Obviously, if you're writing about an issue that doesn't, isn't contentious, um, you don't have to like strongly seek out to find the one person that's against it. That would kind of be going on a, a little too far off the report, reporting trail. But if it's about global warming and there's a protest or something, find the, maybe not necessarily an anti or like a pro, you know, emission or whatever group, but email like oil or gas companies in the area. So not necessarily, it's not always someone that's like, the exact opposite perspective it's just a range of perspectives that make it so you're not leaving anyone out it's really about like if i did this article did i reach out to everyone that would be annoyed if, not annoyed but that a reader would say what what do they think basically so um a follow-up question so regarding the question we just answered um about covering the opposite side of an organization? Would the organization take the majority of the article so the opposing side can be done justice with one small paragraph? Um, I think that depends on the situation. Um, if, I guess whatever, your, whatever angle you're writing your story from, I don't, I don't wanna say like for sure what like what kind of organization you want to pay more attention to but whatever organization or whatever source um gives you the most relevant information the most like information that you need and in context um you want to focus on what there is to focus on and that's kind of your judgment call like what do you feel like is more important what do you feel like can be done justice with few fewer words For arts and entertainment, would you recommend writing it more as a feature, or hard news, or opinion? Um, usually in a lot of newsrooms, I would think um, arts and entertainment is like a subsection under their feature section. It, it's definitely more featurey. Um, I think entertainment news, even like breaking entertainment news, usually would be features, but I'll leave it to features editors to talk more about that if you guys want. Or yeah, I would say it really depends on um, you know, if it's going to be a concert review, that, that would be a review, but still a feature. Um, if it's, you know, talking about, like, profiling an, an artist who, you know, just released um, 
some painting in a museum or something, you know, that's going to be a feature article because it's a profile. Um, and even if it's another type of event that has to do um, with arts or entertainment, it's probably still going to fit under features because you'll probably, you know, try to talk to the artist and see what people, how people feel about the art. Um, so I think in most cases, I would definitely say it would go under features rather than news, unless it's, you know, some real breaking news, but then even then you would have a follow-up feature story on it. Okay, so yeah, to, oh, sorry, just to give like an examples of how it would be hard news, if it was say like a traveling exhibition that's coming to your museum and it's something that people know about already, but they didn't necessarily know, hey, it's gonna be at like the MFA, that would maybe be hard news because it's not necessarily something that needs to be like profiled in depth in a feature. Other than that, I can't think of anything off the top of my head, but there are like very small points of cases where yes, it could be hard news. That exact example, we actually did that for hard, I actually wrote an article about exactly the example that Melissa gave for hard news, it was city news. So yeah, there are definitely cases where exceptions apply. Um, also like if there's uh, like, some sort of, yeah, like an exhi exhibition or statue or other sort of like creative production that um, has historic value and it's like coming to your local town or anything like that where it's so unique that it's not regular. Like regular entertainment news would be like this local artist um, dropped an album or something like that. But when it has, when there's an angle to it that's bigger and more relevant to your community than just people who are interested in arts and entertainment, then that would probably um, allow it to be pushed into hard news territory. Yeah, and I would say an example of something that we've done that has actually like the same event has warranted both in a review and an actual just like hard news is at Boston University, we had the first ever spring concert. And we had one person go and just cover the event straight up, um, talking to people there, just getting their thoughts of students not putting their own opinion in. And then we had a features writer write a review of how they thought the concert went. And so when it's like a big event like that, you might find that there could be just two different people at the organization doing it in totally different ways because a review is totally different than a hard news story of someone covering it. And then uh, a question that says, when doing an article where a lot of the sources are interviews, for example, asking students their opinion on a university change, does that count as feature? So for us, we don't really do articles that are solely asking people for their opinion on something. Usually, like that happens for most of our articles, but it's, we're covering what the change is in that news article, and then we have student reactions to it. So it would be the same article as the um, hard news article that like broke the original information in the first place. Yeah, and I would say that almost every article that you have should have a bunch of interviews from people, whether it be students or not. Um, just like we always say, like you have to have at least like X, like X amount of interviews per article. Like I think we typically do two or three interviews per article and then also separate student interviews where we talk to students. But every article that you're gonna have I know it might not, you might not seem intuitive to know like, oh, they're just, you might write about news, but every article you should be talking to people, um, unless it's a brief where you're just doing a little quick update on something, but all articles include interviews. I don't know if that's the confusion you have, but yeah, when I am, when it's more student centric, even then they could still be hard news. I would also add that the reason behind that like the logic behind why we like have the student quotes and you'll see in our articles we put our student quotes at the end is the news is never the students opinions on it especially at a university as large as Boston University because you're not going to have time to talk to 18,000 students in one day so you're just going to grab the people that you see on the street or see in the dining hall um, and generally I'm not going to be drawn to an article that's just giving me the average person's opinion, the story is always going to be what the change was. And then everything else is just secondary information that like spices it up a little bit, but um, that's never really the news. Uh, there are certain cases where um, like an article could potentially become a feature where, um, but that usually again comes from what the change was, um, not necessarily 
the students' opinions on it once again, because that's just never really, and not even students, just like generally, if you're getting like, if it was a city article and you were asking how the people feel about like the new changes to the T, that would never be the article. It would be that these changes happen to the T and then secondary would be, here's how people are reacting to them. Yeah, um, so I'd like to just kind of bring up some examples. I'm not sure um, which way this question was going, but um, in terms of the coronavirus, I, um, in the spring semester, I took that as an opportunity to really um, build upon our feature story. So I kind of just like, you know, I just asked myself, what, like, what did we, what was campus, what did it used to be like? And how is it affected now? So I would pull different types of groups. So, um, I mean, for one, I did a feature story on, um, I talked to two incoming freshmen and two graduating seniors and highlighted their stories and their opinions on their situation. Um, I did another one on, I talked to, you know, four or five different religious groups on campus and um, just to see how they're adapting to keeping their community online. And Cami wrote a story too, actually, um, about different like art and performance groups on campus and how um, they were affected by, you know, not being able to put on their performances. So um, I'm not sure if that's what you were asking, but those are, you know, examples of when you might take a major change. Um, coronavirus is a really big change, um, the biggest one. But so, yeah, and then talking to a smaller specific group of people on how they were affected or what they think about it. I would say some except some exceptions might exist for like where we have a story that's mostly student opinion and that would happen when maybe there's a petition that pops up or students start like this has happened multiple times just over the last few months where students start like an Instagram account where they are basically um, advocating for a certain issue or things like that where the news is that their opinion basically is so collectively strong that they're advocating for, for it on a bigger scale and so that would um, definitely constitute like a full feature article. Okay so that's our last question right now. Okay so we can go into photojournalism. Okay um I so photojournalism is kind of, you know, separate or separate from written journalism, but central to journalism as a whole. Um, often an image is one of the first things readers see when looking at an article and it can give visual context to stories and shape what people think about and relate to the news that they consume. So it's really important to think critically about how we take photos and then how we use them in the context of the news. Um, so yeah, so um, when seeking out stories, a lot of times, you know, within the context of a newspaper or news outlet, um, a photographer won't be seeking out their own stories, at least when it comes to hard news. Um, they'll be assigned something that's happening and then sent out to cover it. Um, it's a little bit different for feature stories and more like human interest, then you're given the freedom to actually seek out things that interest you in your community. Um, and so with that in mind, the difference between a hard news event and a photo story and how you cover them diverge from the um, With a hard news event, usually it's one or two photos that are going to be seen by the public. And so you want to try and get as much information about the event or thing into that photo as possible. Um, so if you're covering a car crash, per se, you want a photo of the whole scene. You want to kind of show everything that's going on in that one image. Whereas if you're, instead if you're doing a photo story, it's more an unfolding essay. Um, and so you'd actually structure those images more like you would structure a written story. Um, no one image would tell the whole, you know, give you the whole picture, but they would add up to a complete product. Um, yeah. And so then moving on to shooting people, ethics and tactics. Um, making people more comfortable in front of a camera 
uh, also depends on whether or not you're shooting a shorter term project or a longer term project. If you're doing shorter term, you know, introduce yourself, talk to the person, kind of get to know them a little bit before you start shooting, um, just to make them a little bit more comfortable in front of the camera. Don't be afraid to joke around. Um, try to relate to them in some way. Um, if you're doing a longer term project, I would actually recommend going and um, speaking to your subject before you even start shooting. So like going, you know, a day or a week before you start shooting without your camera and just talking to the person, getting the lay of the land, figuring out what's going on, what they like and don't like, what makes them uncomfortable, what makes them comfortable. Um, just get to know them on a human level before kind of invading their space with the lens. Uh, yeah. Um, let's see. Just to jump in, uh, when seeking out stories, um, when you actually have the opportunity to go and like look for your own story, I find that social media is your friend. So like Facebook events are super helpful. Um, maybe you're following very woke friends and their Instagram stories may have an event. Um, local subreddits are always really good too and Twitter as well. And uh, in 2020, with the coronavirus, I think it was pretty jarring for a lot of photographers because we have to be out um, at events, actually, actually saying things, and so many events were canceled. And so we're kind of challenged to create stories where there may not be stories or we, where we wouldn't look to find them before. And so I think now. Um, everyone has been affected by COVID, so there are so many different things you can do now. Um, local businesses. Um, some of the coolest photos I think I've seen have just been from like empty Boston, because I'm so used to it being full and the hustle and bustle, and so seeing like one person on Newbury Street has been so jarring and really impactful. And also politics, because it's an election year, there are senatorial races, there are gubernatorial races, um, there's the presidential <laughs> race, um, and those have sparked a lot of protests. And so protests are a great thing that you can be covering right now as well. Yeah, um, so, okay. Going back to sort of the ethics of shooting people, I think that this ties nicely into um, pro protest coverage, which I know Lauren can also talk to, speak to a lot. Um, but I think it's just, there are two sides to shooting a protest and really any event. Um, it's, you want to be comfortable standing your ground and know what you can and can't do. Um, but also know when to question yourself and your own um, motivations for taking a photograph. Um, and so kind of expanding on that, um, you know, you want to prepare yourself, um, be familiar with uh, the AP style guides guidelines for how to shoot ethically and, you know, how to um, behave at an event, um, not to invade people's spaces, um, shoot people when they don't want their photo taken. Um, you know, being open to questioning why you're taking a photograph. Um, are you only photographing people like you? Are you actively seeking out violence in a protest situation? Is that violence actually representative of the whole event? Um, if not, why are you only covering the more violent aspects of the protest? Um, you know, it's important to think about why, you know, not just going for the action, but getting that whole picture um, so that you don't mislead the public about what's happening at an event. Um, yeah, Lauren, do you wanna? Yeah, um, just some more pragmatic things. Uh, we, we did a lot of protest coverage here at Freep and uh, a lot of that was photo-based. We had a few galleries and there are some things that you should be bringing with you when you're going to protests, especially Black Lives Matter protests. I get pretty heated. Um, I bought swimming goggles. I'm not sure how effective those are, but they started using tear gas and pepper spray here in Boston, and something is better than nothing. Um, also, a backpack. You want to bring water. I got really dehydrated the first day I went out shooting, and sunburn as well. 
Um, you want to bring extra camera batteries and make sure you have extra SD cards. If you run out of space, that's going to really suck. Um, and also you want to make sure to wear a mask. Wear a mask and maybe wear your gloves as well. Um, and then some other things. In Boston, they shut down public transportation. And I commute almost exclusively through the train and that made it really difficult to get back home and it made it really dangerous. So having friends that you can call, um, Uber and Lyft also weren't really being receptive or responsive at that time either. They're like 30 minute wait times. Make sure that you have a way to get out of that sort of situation um, and make sure that you're paying attention to your own safety. It can be really easy to kind of lose track of your surroundings when your eye is in a viewfinder um, and not know that you're putting yourself in harm's way. So making sure to lift your head up um, and be cognizant. Um, your safety is the most important. Yeah. I would also add to that just um, if you wear glasses, if you're in a protest situation that where they might start using chemicals, don't wear contacts. Yeah, I also want to add, um, I literally went to a protest that I was covering last night, and a lot of times you have to kind of be prepared to have people not understand what you're doing. Well, obviously, still always, like, this is for photojournalists and for reporters just in general. Um, people attending the protest won't always understand that you're a reporter and what your duties are. Of course, you have to take into consideration how to make all the protesters as safe as possible, don't risk their identities, but people don't understand that you're not part of the protest and you don't have to do what they want you to do. Um, just last night, basically, they were protesting on the side of the road, cop cars came and wanted people to go out of the way. Someone got arrested, so I was trying to stay behind and film the arrested. I had people yell at me saying, keep going, like, Madden, you have to, you really don't be afraid to assert yourself, like, I'm press, I don't have to do what you're telling me because people just don't under always understand that media is there to report and to get all the information of the protest out there and sometimes people aren't going to like what you're doing and as long as you know you're following proper procedures and guidelines don't let people make you feel bad or tell you not to do something you know it as long as you're not in danger but yeah yeah protests are you know i've had it's not quite the same but i've had people come up to me at protests and question why i'm taking photographs and demand that i blur people's faces out in my images um, which is stressful in the moment. Like it's weird being confronted by someone, especially when you're trying to cover an event. And, you know, just be clear that it's a public space. You have the right to be taking photographs or covering the event. You're just doing your job. And if, like Haley said, if you are following ethical standards, you are in the right. You are okay to be there and you need to be confident in standing your ground because when you're not very quickly, like get super uncomfortable. Um, and kind of building off of that, um, in photography, when you're working for a news source outlet, um, it's really important to get names for your photographs. And oftentimes that's not possible in a protest situation. Um, and so think really carefully when you're taking photographs about um, how you're photographing and if they'll actually be usable if you aren't able to get someone's name. Try always to get you know, people's identities, but if you can't, you wanna have enough material that isn't based around individual people that you won't have anything to publish or you know, turn into your editor. Um, so it's just like a last thing that's worth noting. So we have two questions on the ethics of that. Um, so would you blur the faces um, of the people and how do you protect their privacy at protests when it's such a large scale event? So it's, it's sorry, um, wait, you can go ahead first. Okay, um, so this is a great moment for the Associated Press. Um, blurring photos is a complicated issue. You're not really supposed to do it usually. That said, there are exceptions to every rule. Um, and if you are blurring someone's photograph to protect their identity, um, you know, if they're in danger in some way, you have to very clearly state why that is in the caption of the photograph. This is one of the reasons that captions are so important because they give context to why the photo is the way they are. You shouldn't be altering an image really at all if you can um, for it to be as objective as possible. Um, but that said, there are instances where there are exceptions and you just need to be very clear as to why that exception has been made uh, when describing the image. Um, and in terms of subjects' privacy at protests and large-scale events, 
it's complicated. I mean, when I've been covering, when I've been photographing events, I've been thoughtful about this because I'm not going to blur people's faces, um, but also I try not to have photos that clearly identify people if I can't get their names or I can't get their permission. Um, but yeah, it's a balance. They are in a public place. Um, technically, you are allowed to photograph them. There is an ethical line that can you can feel like you've crossed, but yeah. I also see a question, is smartphone useful for photojournalism and video journalism? Uh, absolutely. I also think now a lot of people, uh, they don't have the income to afford their own camera and a lot of people rely on their college. Uh, we have a field production services where you can rent your camera um, and a lot of camera equipment. And so especially now when a lot of people don't have access to that, they are relying on their smartphone. And I know someone who works at the Somerville Journal and she's the editor there and she exclusively takes pictures and video on an iPhone 8. So I think um, also some of the most impactful images and videos I've seen, uh, if you saw any of the coverage of the explosion in Beirut, uh, some of the videos from that were taken on smartphone and I thought they were really powerful and they've been shared so many times. So don't limit yourself to your equipment. Um, yeah, and also um, a lot of time, fo iPhones and phones in general are increasingly becoming useful for journalists who are expected to produce all of the content. Um, so a lot of times newspapers will send out one reporter and not a photojournalist to cover an event. And it's very, very useful for someone to be able to take notes on their phone, do recordings, um, take video, and then also take photos. So yes, a phone is your friend. Like, it's always ideal to have a really nice camera to take pictures with, but if you're covering hard news and you don't have your camera with you or you simply don't have a camera, it's really, they're just as good in the end. I would also say phones are really important for just like social media like nowadays especially if you're covering an event obviously if it's just a regular story you're taking photos for not as much but if you're covering a protest or some sort of event that people want, should hear about as it goes on at the moment phones are so helpful whether you're live tweeting some quotes and photo and video content or you're live streaming on Twitter um, those are really great tools um, they make putting your story together after easier because you've literally been Kind of compiling a live stream but also some things just need to get out there right as they happen and that's specific with protests i'd say for sure and just regarding protests i also want to reiterate what vivian said previously about um asking for names because um the at least here at the free what we've been doing for protests in boston is if you can't get like like whenever you have a photo that you took with someone's face prominently in it and they're identifiable, you wanna go up to them and get their name so that that way they know that you took their photo and they know that you're gonna use your name because that photo is gonna be published. So it gives them full leeway to either consent or not consent. And that way you know that they're um, willing to have their photos shown. Um, and if you're not able to do that, there are plenty of ways to accurately photograph protests um, without showing a bunch of people's faces. You can um, do from above, like show like the sea of protest signs. There are so many different, you can do close-ups of different um, like body parts that are relevant. Like there are just a lot of different ways that you could photograph something without having to um, worry about blurring out faces that you took pictures of. Yeah, to touch on that a little, um, for free, we did have a few photos that showed people's whole faces and both of these people were people who were pepper sprayed and I went up to them and I interviewed them <laughs> and I got their names and I made sure that they were okay because I believe they're both also under the age of 18 um, and so that made it a little more sticky but yeah and then also um, as I started covering more protests I learned to take or pictures that showed less. Um, so doing like silhouettes or taking wide shots that don't really focus on any one person in particular um, is really good as well. Or making sure that you're kind of focusing more on people who are masked. Are there any other questions? Okay, 
just gonna come back to the slide. So in terms of how to find photos, um, this is kind of about finding courtesy images. Um, so if you are, for example, for the features section, most of the reviews that people were doing were for, you know, an artist's new album release or a new Netflix series. Um, in those cases, you reach out to either the band's management or Netflix or whatever organization it is that you're writing about and request courtesy images. They will always have them. Um, it's easy. It's the best way to make sure that you're getting photos that are not, that you're actually allowed to use and publish because there's always the sticky issue of using um, photos that are copyrighted and that you don't have the right to republish. And you can get in a lot of trouble for infringing on co other people's copyright. Um, another great tool that I used a lot in my time as photo editor um, was Wikimedia Commons, which is just open license images that anyone can use and post. And using the um, labeled for reuse designation on Google photo searches, which will only bring up images that you're allowed to publish without, you know, with just crediting the photographer and you don't have to pay for the use, right to use them. Um, and so that's just kind of the tip of the iceberg of the whole issue of intellectual property and photography. Um, but it's really important to think about if you're not using your own photographs for a story, um, how to make sure that you're getting them ethically and in a way that won't get you or the organization that you're working for in trouble. Because it is very, very easy to make a mistake and get into like actual legal trouble with people. So you don't want to mess around with this stuff. Um, like one of the, I worked for an organization that wasn't a newspaper a few summers ago and I don't own any, I don't own any of the photographs that I took for them. So I had to actually sign paperwork with them that allowed me to use the images that I had taken because they didn't belong to me anymore. So it, it's just, it, it gets complicated fast. Um, yeah, Lauren, do you have anything to add to that or do you want to keep going? I, I think you got it. Um, so moving on to ethical photo editing. Um, this is another section where the Associated Press is your friend. Um, I love the AP's guides on how to edit photos and basically the bottom line is do as little as possible. Um, you shouldn't be photoshopping your images at all. Uh, basically, you should only be doing basic color corrections. Um, and you don't, you know, even for major news outlets like CNN um, and the Associated Press, even cropping an image can be problematic and you have to justify it because you can be changing how people see whatever happened. Um, and so, um, so yeah, you really want to maintain the accuracy of the images that you're editing um, and not change them in any way that would change how people view them. Um, and it's really, with stuff like this, it's easiest just to go to the Associated Press and look at their guidelines and make sure that you're not um, violating them in any way. And also to speak to the organization that you're working with or four and figure out what their guidelines are. So you're not accidentally violating um, something that will then get you in trouble down the line. Um, Cause it's, it's really, you know, sometimes you wanna like get rid of some, a pimple or something, but that's not, you're altering the reality of the photo. And so it's no longer ethical and not publishable. Yeah. Yeah. I um... One example of how cropping can be problematic is if any of you um, remembered not too long ago, Fox News ran a photo of it was Jeffrey Epstein, Melania Trump, um, I think Maxwell was in there too, and they cropped out Donald Trump. 
and that was really big news <laughs> and they got a lot of heat for it and they apologized because not including uh, <laughs> the president in a kind of photo like that with such a controversial figure has a lot of implications. Yeah. Um, and so another kind of case study that might be useful for thinking about this is so say you're working for a publication that doesn't isn't okay with cropping images normally, um, but you have a picture of, you know, Donald Trump shaking hands with the president of Brazil, and there's an eight like an aide off to the side who you can't identify, um, but the image feels important. You could get permission from your organization to crop the person out of it and then include in the caption an explanation as to why the image is cropped and what information is missing. So as long as you're being clear about why an image has been altered, it's okay. Um, yeah, okay, moving on to correct captioning. Um, again, the Associated Press gives you a really clear outline of how you should be captioning photos, but basically it's uh, your average caption is two sentences um, the first, you're describing in the present tense um, what's going on in the photo, um, where it's taking place, like in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, you provide the date that the photo was made, oftentimes the time of day. Um, for example, Tuesday, January 27th, 2015, or Tuesday afternoon. Um, and you want to do it in that order. And then the second sentence of the caption is used to give context to whatever the event is and why it's significant. So for example, if you have a photograph of a dog playing in the park, the first sentence would be, you know, Ralph the puppy plays at Washington Square Park on Tuesday afternoon. And then the second part would be um, about the event. So it would be like, it was part of a puppy parade that was happening um, to raise money for the ASPCA. And so the first sentence is always in the present tense and the second sentence can take place in the past tense but gives context to why the photo is important. Um, yeah. And then with um, bias in photojournalism, Vivian touched on this a bit as well, but um, I think as photojournalists, we can kind of get in the habit of patting ourselves on the back because like oh what you see with our photo is what you get that's what happened but that's not really the case um at the end of the day ultimately the pho photojournalist is the one who's choosing what goes into your frame and so even that right there that's that's bias um you need to make sure that you're not choosing to photograph people who just look like yourself Maybe those are people who you'd feel more comfortable to go up to after and ask for their names or ask to get permission to use their photo. Um, you want to make sure, as with um, the protest coverage, that you're not taking a picture that's perpetuating a negative stereotype um, incorrectly. Um, and that's very important. And yeah, if you have anything to add. Yeah, when you're choosing your own stories or what, you know, like in the past, I've just been sent out on assignments to go find feature photos that'll like spice up, you know, a centerfold spread. Um, and when you're doing that, you want to think really critically about how you're choosing the, your subject matters and why you're choosing your subject matters and how any bias you might have could be contributing to that. And then similarly, when you're, you know, if you are covering really anything, any event, any building that you'll photograph, any person that you'll photograph, you want to really not be lazy about how you're composing the images, how you're approaching taking the images, because once we kind of like let go of thinking critically about why we're taking an image the way we are and how to compose the image and expose it and all of that, um, you start not doing justice to your subject matter. And sometimes that's just, you know, ends up being a boring photograph, but other times that can actually be harmful to the person or place that you're covering. Um, so just always, you know, stay on the ball, stay aware, and I think you'll be fine. Um, yeah.
Um, before we move on, oh wait, do we have any questions in the Q&A box? I don't think so. Oh yeah, you're my favorite. Um, okay, <sighs> organizing photos is something that I've always struggled with and I think a lot of people struggle with, um, especially because as we've moved into a more digital age, the way that we organize photographs has changed a lot. Um, so, okay, a must have is a hard drive. Um, if you don't have a hard drive and ideally a backup hard drive, I don't have right now, um, to save doubles of all of your photographs, you're really just not doing yourself any favors um, because you will lose. I have lost probably hundreds of photos since I started taking pictures because of my own negligence. Um, so you want a good hard drive um, and then you want to have good editing tools as well. A really basic good editing tool is Lightroom. It allows you to do all of your metadata stuff as well as the actual editing of photographs. I now use Adobe Bridge and Photoshop, which is a similar sort of thing where you can basically put your photos all into Bridge, um, figure out which ones you want by rating them, and then putting in metadata, which is so important. Um, it's basically a way of identifying the photograph, um, where it was taken, when it was taken, um, who it was taken by, copywriting it, um, and it's just a way of knowing the context for the photograph because even though a picture is worth a thousand words, it's so easy to figure out what was actually happening, the name of the person who's in the photograph, when it was taken, why it was taken. So it's really important that you put in the metadata of the photo what it is, what it means. Um, and then building off of that, it's really important, like I said before, that you copyright your images because if you post them anywhere, people can take them from you. And if they are not properly copyrighted, then you can't defend yourself when you find out that someone is using your photo without your permission or without compensating you. Um, this is something that I've also done in the past and that I'm trying to train myself out of always copyright your photographs um, because people can slurp them off of Instagram, they can slurp them off of your website, they can slurp them off of Google. Like, once they're out in the world, they're free to use if you haven't protected them properly. Um, yeah. Um, sorry, this is kind of like the more boring side of photojournalism, but um, similarly, when you're saving your images, when you're editing them, I always save a raw or digital negative file of my photographs and then the edited image. So you'll always have the largest file to come back to if something happens to your edited image and then you can then save JPEGs or TIFFs or smaller files of the image to then share with your editor or post on Instagram or your website or whatever you want to use it for. Um, yeah, I think that that's pretty much it in terms of organizing your photos. Um, I don't know if Lauren has anything she wants to build off of on that. Uh, yeah, um, I guess also if you're in a university, you probably have unlimited storage on Google Drive and that's also a really nice thing to have um, as like a backup of your backup of your backup. <laughs> um, but yeah, that and making sure that when you're taking photos, you're putting them in the folders and you're, you're labeling those folders appropriately and then you're dating them as well. Um, I'm guilty of just like throwing things into a folder and slamming my hand on the keyboard and then <laughs> my folder is like J, Y, T, and then I, I never know what any of the photos are in them. So make sure to take the extra five seconds, um, save yourself the hassle in the future. Yeah. Okay, so um, curating a strong portfolio. When you have a whole body of work um, that you can show off to the world, you want to choose a select few images that best represent what you've done. Um, so I was sort of thinking about this both as photo stories, how to choose your photo story, and then how to choose your photo portfolio, which are two different things. So really quickly, choosing a photo story, just think of it as you would an article or an essay. Um, you want to have a really clear introduction, uh, which is like a introductory photo that gives you a sense of the scene that you're photographing or the place that you're photographing, whatever it is. Um, so if you're photographing, for example, um, 
you know, a chess game, you want a, a founding image of the whole scene, you know, the chess players, the people watching them, um, whatever else is happening around them. So yeah, and then you want like a thesis image, which will be giving context and telling the viewer why these images are important, why they want to engage with this photo story. And then you have your content, you know, like the middle paragraphs, which are just sort of threading together the narrative of the story, restating the thesis, why does the story matter? And then a conclusion image, something that ties it up at the end, gives you a sense of a conclusion, finality. Um, on the flip side, with a strong portfolio, you're not so much telling a narrative as you are punching home how great you are. So you don't want repetitive images in either, but you really want to choose your strongest pieces. Um, a lot of times I think that this is really good. It's really good to use hard news images for a portfolio because they tell a whole story in one picture. Um, you know, if you're setting up a page of singles, you can have the images that you took at the high school football game. You can have the images that you took of the music story time thing that happened at the library. You can have that really great photo that you took of farmers working in a field and the really great protest shot that you got at the most recent protest. And it'll give a sense of your range as a photographer. Yeah, Lauren wants to build on that. <laughs> Uh, it's nice to also have a few different types of portfolios. I have like PowerPoint kind of portfolios that you can like send off to someone in an email. I also have um, a website and there are a lot of different websites that you can use to kind of build your own portfolio that are super user friendly and intuitive. Um, a lot of people use Squarespace, uh, which is really great and very minimalistic. Uh, I don't think you have quite as much free reign to construct the page as you would like. You're following templates a lot of the time. Um, on the flip side, there's also Wix. I use Wix and you have a lot more freedom to design the website as you like. But once you pick a template, you're stuck with that template. <laughs> so you're, you're taking a hit on anything you, you do. But I definitely would re recommend having a website. Pretty much every photojournalism student I know has a website. Um, and it's just, it's just really nice to have so that when someone asks you, oh, you do photo, uh, can I see like some of your work, then you can just like tell them to hit up your website. It's also, it's good to label your website with your name. Um, so my name's Lauren Allen. My website's laurenallen.com. Um, it's nice not to have something really embarrassing <laughs> so that when people ask you, you don't feel weird telling them. Um, and just... So it's a little more professional, especially if you're applying for a job as well. Yeah. Um, I use Squarespace, um, but also if you're really serious about having just like a nice professional layout and you're willing to spend the money, Photo Shelter is a great tool. Someday I hope to use Photo Shelter um, when I get my life together, but um, it actually is both a cloud-based cloud storage system and a por website portfolio. So it kind of combines both into one which is really great. But anyways, yeah, I think that that's it. Um. Next, we're gonna get into video journalism. Well, I also, I see someone just wrote a question. Oh. So I can answer that real fast. It says websites can be used for por portfolio and articles you've written that you want to compile together, right? Um, I think on my website, I have both articles that I've done and I have photos because at BU, you end up doing a lot of both. So absolutely, I think one of the writers can probably answer this better um, than I can. <laughs> Yeah, so on website, if you're just a reporter and you're not a photojournalist, absolutely make a website as soon as you can. Um, it's great to put it, throw it in your Twitter bio, and you're going to want that for when you start applying for jobs and internships, but it's just such a great place to, like, put your best stories on it. You could find a fun way to organize it by publication you've done stuff for, put your resume on there, put social link, just everything. It's, like, a good to have a website and have it made. Um, if that way in the same way if you're out reporting and someone's like hey where can I see some of your work just be like go to this website and I use Squarespace too um, for that so it's great for for reporting compiling too 
Yeah, I think everyone, no matter what field you are in or whatever your work is in, you should have a website just because it's like the only place where it's consolidating all that you are professionally. Like whatever work you do, if you want to display it somewhere, put it on your website. It's all comprehensive of you. And I just think it's a great idea that for, you know, if someone is like, if, if a potential employer is looking to check you out and, you know, obviously they don't have your resume, they don't know where to get it. If they can find your website like that, could be how people scout you. It's just good to have some place where you're represented online. It's like your own little space. Are there other questions? Yeah. So yeah, we can get into um, video journalism. Um, so yeah, I well, I'll let Caroline and Cami introduce themselves, but I think that video journalism is a really good way to, you know, just incorporate um, what we've been talking about with um, especially feature writing and give that visual um, aspect to it too, um, because it, you know, there's only so much that you can share through words. So um, incorporating both photography and video um, is a really great tool. All right, so hi, I'm Caroline. I was the video editor last semester, um, and I'm going to be talking about video today. Hi, I'm Cami. Um, I've done video stuff for the Boston Globe and um, Business Insider. So today we're going to go over a couple of things such about like what could be a good video story, the impact of video journalism, the shooting, editing process, and how that kind of differs um, in a pandemic. So yeah. Kimmy, do you want to talk about what could be a video story? Yeah, so as you know, when you probably go to various article on um, a website or if you encounter it on Instagram or any of the social media channels, not every news story or article has a visual element like a video. And so um, a good rule of thumb is to always choose something to cover that has a conflict that has visual elements. For example, um, back in March when schools were closing across the country, Harvard in Massachusetts was, I think, one of the first schools to close in the country. And so that was a good story just because there were so many students who were grappling with um, being low income, not having housing security, and to capture that reaction and those emotions on camera was really powerful. Also, um, there's just a lot of visual elements that go into that, like catching B-roll of people packing up their stuff, moving out, like saying goodbye to their friends. There's so many visual elements that you can use to craft a really powerful short documentary that adds to um, the new story. I think that's like a really great point. I think also another thing with video is sometimes you'll go in and you'll have one intention on making a video about something, but sometimes when you talk to someone, it will kind of change over time. Um, and I think, uh, like, I remember when I was in high school, I kind of did this little short documentary on a youth hostel. Um, and originally it was about like very like, basically like, oh, what is a hostel and all those things. But then it came, became more about like communal living um, and like the people that are in that community. So as you're talking to people and as you're talking to subjects, I think what's cool about video is kind of forming those relationships and what people open up about can really change the um, direction of your story, which can be cool. Um, and then the impact of video journalism, I think kind of like what Sarah went, was talking about before, um, I think it's cool because it's a little bit different than reading a story because you get to see someone and you get to see like what Cameron was talking about, that B-roll, um, people in action. And so it kind of gives like a lot of visuals. And sometimes with video, it doesn't necessarily have to be like all interviews the whole time. It can also just be words on a screen, kind of just like matching those sort of things. Um, and yeah, and I also like another thing that's cool about video journalism is it can go in so many different directions because you can do like a tour of a place you can do an interview um you can film an event and i think it kind of can it there's so many different outlets to it so it's really whatever you want it to be yeah and just going off of that you don't always have to um 
make a video to complement a new story, it can be in place of something. So for example, um, you see like Vogue or Business Insider, all of those big outlets do like the 73 questions or the rise and fall of a company. And that's not necessarily, that doesn't always complement an article. Um, you can also use it as a trailer for a bigger feature, for a big investigation um, that's being done or something that is just a really big project that your newsroom is doing. It can be used as like kind of a preview for when that is launching. Yeah. Um, and then, so the shooting and editing process is a little bit different right now, obviously in the world. Um, but I can talk about a little bit about it at BU. Um, I'm not a community, I'm actually in the School of Hospitality, so I didn't have access, so I had to have my associates um, get me equipment last semester, but now I have my own camera, which is nice, um, and kind of going out and shooting. So typically you would want, if you're doing an interview, um, one of the cameras the school has a lav mic and then potentially a shotgun mic, depending on where you are. Um, it's always nice to have both, just in case something happens with audio and then a tripod, obviously. Um, if you're doing an interview, if you're not doing an interview, um, you might just want like a tripod and the camera with the shotgun mic um, when you're going into something and that's pretty typical. But um, shooting in a pandemic and doing those sort of things are very different. So using the recording button on Zoom when you're in an interview and then also working with people. For example, um, I did a video at the end of the semester about the students that were still on campus so I was really lucky because I had a couple of friends still on campus. And so having them go out and to be you recording themselves in places, um, showing how the campus is empty and kind of working around it because you do really have to improvise sometimes with this stuff, especially right now. Um, and so, yeah, also like talking, uh, my friend was recently in something um, with BU today and they they like told him that like he had to like get these certain, certain shots. They had a shot list for him. Um, and so working with the person you're interviewing a lot is a lot of communication, which is obviously kind of hard and it's not exactly what you want, but it's the climate we're in. Um, and then going off of that, I guess with editing, I would recommend using Premiere Pro if you can be, you gives you it for free. Um, so I don't know why you wouldn't use it. Sometimes it crashes. So that's really fun. Um, but yeah, <laughs> do you have anything to add, Cam? Yeah, so the shooting process is usually just very sloppy. Um, there's a lot of the, there's a lot of times where I've had to go out and reshoot things. Um, for example, when I produced a documentary back in March, that was just breaking news about how all of the schools in Boston were closing and kicking students out. So, being able to produce something that adds substance to the article, whether that's showing emotion or just um, students' reaction was important, but getting it out on a timely manner can a lot of the times mean having to go back and reshoot, finding, you might find a different subject and then you have to conduct interviews again. Um, and in a lot of cases, some things might change. For example, like students expressed rage that their school was kicking them off, but then the school ended up, for example, like giving them money or um, something. And so to make that video fair, you would have to also um, interview the school or just update, ask the subject if they still feel that way based on circumstances. Um, so a lot of the times it's, you have to just redo things, go out and shoot again. Um, and it can be exhausting like when you have to get it out within three days um yeah yeah so um last semester me and caroline worked together on um some feature article and video collaborations and um so i think that's something that we can kind of talk about you know both sides of that process um so one example was um every every year we try to do some themed issues so we were doing a music issue um and so for our science section we were doing you know like the the science behind music and what kind of like um you know kind of science music related courses are offered at bu through the college of fine arts um and so i got in touch with a professor who teaches musicology and um yeah so 
Caroline came up to me and asked like if I had any upcoming stories that would be interesting to do for a video and I was telling her about that because obviously like you can't you know show someone's music through an article so I thought that video would be a good supplement so then you can talk about when you went and you started that process with him. Yeah that was one of my favorite videos I think like I've ever done because um so at BU we have an apartment called like I don't most people don't know this but it's musicology and ethnomusicology and it's a minder um and it's not very like talked about and so because I had this conversation with Sarah and um the article ended up being a little bit different than what we originally intended it to be but um I still got the chance to meet every like people were on sabbatical it was complicated kind of like what Sammy was uh, what Kimmy was saying um there's a lot of ups and downs, but sometimes with video, but it ended up, we ended up, me and my associates meeting with two professors in the department. And we had this really cool video about this small department and how you can learn about um, like diversity and other things through um, music. And I think social, ju social justice is like a major part of that department. And I think in the global climate, like when it was um, put out, I think it's really important um, to kind of, I think video can kind of, tell multiple stories. So yeah, we're talking about music, but there was so much more to that story besides music, which was really cool. Yeah, and so we could also talk about um, preparing for a video interview would be the same thing as um, preparing for any other kind of article. Um, and we talked about this a little bit last week where you really wanna get those um, in-depth questions and you know find out the whys and the hows. Um, and that's especially important with video because you don't want to ask someone a question and then on camera just have them say yes in response to what you said. Um, so you really want to think about how to phrase your questions in a way that will get um, the person's opinion and their emotion and um, both with what quotes we would pull for an article, the same goes for what quotes we would pull into a video as you want those quotes that are something that the, the only the subject would say that you couldn't paraphrase to match um, the same, you know, tone and emotion that they had when they said it. Yeah, I think that's especially true, Sarah. I think sometimes the only, that's what can be tough in video is some people aren't very comfortable on camera when you interview them, and so it's, like, making them feel comfort, comfortable and safe on camera, and, like, um, I think establishing some sort of connection, um, like, for example, with the ethnomusicology guy, we both really love the Howard Thurman Center, so we talked about that a little bit before, um, and we talked about some other things. And then so when I was talking to him, sometimes I would ask him more in-depth questions and that would have like a more provocative and deeper answer. Just going back to um, video reporting in a pandemic, it looks a lot different now since um, social distancing guidelines are in place and a lot of the times your newsroom won't want you to sacrifice people's health or your own health um, for a good video. And so we've seen a lot of stuff I know back in March um, when I was working on investigation with the Globe. They conducted a lot of their interviews for this video that we made um, on Zoom. And so we ended up using that footage for that documentary um, that was made. And while still also using B-roll from past shots of like Massachusetts or um, other footage that was used in the past was still used for that. And so you can still make a video in the pandemic. The process just looks a little different with all of the guidelines in place. So on to audience engagement. This is important just for a sustainable news organization, um, seeing what where your readers are coming from, what draws them to your site, um, what keeps new readers coming back, and how do you turn readers into subscribers. And so a lot of this can come down to social media, email marketing, and the different purposes that those platforms serve. Um, for example, as you may know that a lot of every new news organization has a presence on the main social media platforms, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, um, and then 
dabbling into TikTok. And so um, this is just a great way to distribute the content that your organization is producing. Um, a lot of things that big organizations get into um, is analytics and seeing, you know, what stories people are spending the most time on reading, how long are they staying on those stories. Um, and in a lot of cases, organizations I've worked at have tailored some of their coverage to what's keeping readers interested. Um, at the Globe, we saw that there was a peak interest in the coronavirus back in January. And so um, they just started ramping up the coverage about that very early on. Um, and it's just a, it's just a way to um, get new readers. How are you gaining new readers, especially since um, advertising has gone down? It's really important to see what's keeping readers subscribed, which articles they're reading before they subscribe and um, all of that. We have a question about, um, are there any ethical guidelines for video journalism? Yeah, so the ethical guidelines. Um, so I guess, um, well, yeah, so I guess, um, hmm, that's an interesting question. Um, I guess you can share, like, I wouldn't go too personal with them, just like make someone feel comfortable. But um, I think there, of course, like with any sort of journalism, there is like a level of professionalism and then always ask them what they're comfortable with. So if someone says something and then after emails you and you're like, I'm not okay putting this on camera, then you need to respect that. Um, like, if you're gonna, like I had a friend who um, hadn't come out to her family and we were talking about maybe doing a video together and she was like, I'm not comfortable with this actually, then you don't, then you don't do it there you want to really respect your, the person who's in your video um, because that's really important. And because you, like, you have to respect that that's their time too. A lot of it's similar to photo stuff. Um, you can't be photoshopping and like um, changing or altering images or like video or any of that. You can't be doing that. Um, the laws with filming on public and private property, it's always important to get to like know those laws before you go shoot um, or to contact, you know, if it's a private property, contact the employer um, or the media relations person to just see if you have permission to shoot that just because you don't want to go out and spend like 12 hours shooting something and then have to go back because you did it on private property. Yeah, in fact, we actually, um, the first time Cami and I and um, our other, uh, videography we went to Harvard to shoot that thing we spent an entire afternoon and evening there and then came back and realized that the footage was unusable because we did not first get permission from Harvard to shoot there and that's not something that you want to um, be facing so always be aware of what legal problems you might run into and really vet the venue before you just go shooting video wherever and just um, make sure you yeah, going off that, just make sure you go over all of that stuff with your editor before you go out there, um, because they should have a better understanding and be able to work with, like, the lawyer, the legal, just to make sure you've covered all the grounds for making sure it's um, legal to post. And regarding what Caroline was saying about respecting people's privacy, that definitely goes for, you know, regular private people, but it does not, it's, it's not necessarily the case for um, public officials that you're holding accountable. If you're doing a video, like an investigative documentary or something like that, where you're just exposing wrongdoing and holding people accountable, that's like, yeah, they're not going to want you to publish that, but that's video that you totally have the right to um, put forward anyways. Yeah, absolutely. And also, um, talking about legality, copyright music is like a huge thing in video that can be challenging. Um, last semester there was this video I was editing and I literally I remember I sent it to um top to like 10 times like just like changing the audio every time because music is like a huge copyright issue um in regards to um video but yeah absolutely what Angela was saying it's like depending on the type of video if it's a very personal feature you don't want to like expose something but if it's investigative reporting absolutely yeah
Any other questions? And then are we finished with audience engagement? Okay. So that's pretty much the end of our instructional session. So thank you to those who submitted your pitches through that Google form that I sent out. Um, so your assignment for the second week is basically to start working on your story. So um, an editor will reach out to you soon to kind of help you work through what story out of those pitches you want to actually pursue. And then you're, we're going to be here to guide you as you go about your reporting. Um, so yeah, expect to hear from us. And basically, yeah, use what you learned in the last um, session to also help guide the guide you through the process. Um, you should have all received the recording of that last session if you didn't manage to attend. So yeah, just email us if you have any questions. Okay. And then now we're gonna do something kind of fun and exciting. We're gonna go into breakout rooms where you guys are all gonna be able to show your faces and unmute yourselves. So basically in the email where you received all the links for today, um, choose one, like whatever section you find yourself most interested in, choose one, you can join that room. Um, and then the editors of that section will be there. And then you can um, talk more about, you know, your interest in that specific section. Um, you can ask questions about it, ask questions about um, your career goals, um, our experiences, um, things like that. And you can kind of just connect with the other attendees. So that's it for this meeting. So yeah, just remember to join the big girl rooms. All right. Thank you everyone for coming. Oh, Is there there's, a, there's a question if we can post um, the Google 